you got your Bible, put them in your hand. We'll have our confessions. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. I can be who it says I can be. My mind's alert. My heart's receptive to receive the uncompromising, the unchanging, the infallible seed of the Word of God. For this is God's Word speaking to me. Look to your neighbor and say, this is God's Word speaking to you. So be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. You may be seated if you can. My, my, my. I enjoy our Wednesday night Amen. Bible study. It gives us a chance to dive into some scriptures and get refreshed, but also get taught some few things. That's what it's all about is getting stronger in the word and, and, and learning and being a doer of the word and not here only. Amen. That's very important. So we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. But the title of my message is Practice Makes Perfect. Practice makes perfect. So we're going to get into what we, what do we, what are we practicing in our walk with Christ? So let's look at uh, uh, a key scripture tonight. It's First John chapter three, verse nine and ten. So be patient with me tonight. We're going to tie all this in together. But I learned a long time ago: the more you practice, the better you get. So 1 John 3, chapter 9 and 10 says, Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Now, we all know we've sinned and come short of the glory of God. But when we, when we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. We go to him and ask forgiveness. We're quick to repent. Amen? Amen. And it's for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. I'm going to come back and explain this in just a minute. But here it says, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil. Notice there's two references here. There's children of God and there's children of the devil. Everyone falls in one of those two categories. Right. Of the devil who are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. So you have to practice righteousness to be of God. Nor is he who does not love his brother. Now, the... English Standard Version translation clarifies it a little bit better. It says this. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. No one born of God, no child of God makes a practice of sinning. So if you have a, a habit of sinning and, and you're struggling with something, you, you, you need some help. Amen? Amen? Because if you're born of God and you're a child of God... Sin has no hold on you. Come on, church. Yes. For God's seed abides in him. God's seed abides in you, and he cannot keep on sinning. This is the English Standard Version. Because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God nor is the one who does not love his brother. This explains why Christians cannot practice sin. You cannot live a lifestyle of sin if you're a born-again Christian. You don't hear that taught a lot, but it's in the Word of God. Because it is in, incompatible with the Holy Spirit. Sin is incompatible with the Holy Spirit. Who has imparted, the Holy Spirit has imparted a new nature to the believer. God makes us new creatures. We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. We hear that over and over again. Being a new creation means we let the old things go. Right? This new nature displays the character of God. This new nature displays God's righteousness. Amen? Now, we've all heard the phrase that practice makes perfect. A lot of you know, maybe some of you don't know, I spent quite a few years coaching. I coached my boys growing up. I coached, I got two boys. I coached one in baseball and one in football. 
we were very successful in, in baseball and football, very successful, won championships, went to Florida, competed in the Super Bowl two years in a row, but we, we were very successful because I learned early on that, that, that the more I practice, the more we practice, the better we get. Come on, church. The more we practice, the better we get. See, I, I can out-practice the other teams. They, when teams were practicing, maybe some of them didn't practice at all. They just showed up on games. But some of them practiced once, maybe twice a week. But I would practice two or three times a week. Because the more you practice, the better you get. Right. Amen? Vince Lombardi said that perfect practice makes perfect. Michael Jordan once quoted that you can shoot eight hours a day but if your technique is wrong, all you, become is, all you become is good at shooting the wrong way. That is true. You will get good at shooting the wrong way. Matter of fact, some of you older people may remember back in the day when they would shoot free throws, they would actually shoot them underhanded when they first started basketball. And they still, I think a lot of them are quite, a, the, the good ones would have 80 some percent free throw percentage. That means they would make 80 some percent of their shots, right? So what, what I'm trying to get, the point that I want to make tonight is that you practice, what you practice, you become good at. Let me say that again. What you practice, you will become good at. Yeah. Amen? Amen? The meaning of the phrase, practice makes perfect, is to keep repeating something over and over until you become good or great at it. See, the question tonight is, what are we practicing? We'll get into that a little bit later. Now, I took, I took a, a typing class in school because I needed a credit or something or a half a credit or, you know, say, why did you take a, well, it was an easy class. You know, back then we was looking for some easy credits. We didn't want to do a lot of work. <laughs> so I took a typing class. I passed the class, but I never learned how to type. <laughs> Go figure that. Never did learn how to type. Not even the least narrow bit did I learn how to type. Amen. But also took piano lessons. My mom made me take piano lessons. So, but playing the piano wasn't something that I desired to do. I didn't desire to play the piano. But mom wanted me to play the piano. So she made me take piano lessons. Oh, I dreaded it. It was like come in from playing outside and, and practice the piano or go to the lady's house and take piano lessons. I couldn't do it. So finally she realized I just wasn't cut out for the piano lessons. We, I just couldn't, I didn't have it in me. It wasn't in me. It wasn't a gift that I had. But I liked the drums. And I practiced the drums. And I became a drummer. I became a pretty good drummer. Didn't take no lessons, but it was something that I wanted. It was desire I wanted. So I wanted to play the drums, so I practiced and became good at it. Amen? So you will pursue the things you want. Doesn't mean that they'll always be easy. At some point in time, you'll get frustrated. Even as Christians, we get frustrated, right? It reminds me of a story I come across. A ballad singer studied under a strict teacher, wanted to be a singer, who insisted that he rehearse every single day. Didn't, you couldn't miss a day. You had to rehearse every day. Day after day, month after month, he would rehearse. He would rehearse the same passage from the same song. Every day singing the same song without being permitted to go any further. Every day this young, this young person would sing. He would sing the same passage of the same song every day, day after day, month after month. Finally, overwhelmed by frustration and, dis and now despair had set in, the young man ran off to find another profession. He got discouraged. He got frustrated. One night, stopping in at a, uh, at a hotel or inn, he stumbled upon what they call a recital contest, a recitation contest, a singing contest. Having nothing to lose, he entered the competition and, of course, sang the one passage that he knew so well, the one that he'd been practicing. When he had finished, the sponsor of the contest highly praised his performance. Despite the student's embarrassed objections, the sponsor refused to believe that he had just heard a beginner perform. And he said, tell me, said the sponsor, who is your instructor? He must be a great master. 
The student later became known as the great performer Kashiji. So the point is that practice, when you practice something over and over again, you're going to get good at it, right? Especially when it's something that you want and something you desire. But there may be times in life as a Christian that you also get frustrated. How many have been frustrated as a Christian at some point in time in your life? You know, we've been, all been frustrated. You don't understand why bad things happen to good people. You don't understand the tests, the trials, and the tribulation that we have to go through or that we do go through. But when you practice, when you practice every day being a Christian, not just being a Christian, being a strong Christian, being a child of God, being a doer of the word and not a hearer only, whatever you do, you will be blessed. Amen. Practice being a strong Christian every single day, day after day, month after month. Amen? Amen. James 1.22, if you got your Bibles, turn me to James 1.22. We're going to read verse 20 through 25. But it says, some of you can quote it by heart, to be doers of the word and not a hearers only. We said that a while ago. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Now, why did, they put, why did he put that in there? Because if you're just a hearer only, you're deceiving yourself. You follow me? Self-deception in this scripture is believing that hearing the word is enough. Enough what? Enough to be a strong Christian? Enough to have strong faith? Enough to be an overcomer? Enough to what we sung a while ago? Being victorious? I could go on and on. Amen? But self listen, self-deception in this scripture is also denying the importance of the first part of the scripture. What is the first part of the scripture? Come on. Be doers of the word. What's the first part of the scripture? Be doers of the word and not hearers only. We hear that over and over again, but I'm going to make sure you get it tonight. Amen? Self-deception self in the scripture, denying the important part of the first part of scripture, or is convincing yourself that hearing the word is as good as being a doer of the word. A lot of people believe that. I know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But the Bible also says be a doer of the word. I like what the Macmillan description, I mean the Macmillan dictionary description says about this phrase. It says, describes the phrase self-deception as this, to refuse to believe something because you don't want to. That's what the Macmillan dictionary says about this phrase. It says refuse to to believe something because you don't want to. See, a lot of people don't want to believe that the Bible is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But it is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Bible says, the study Bible says that being doers of the word emphasizes that your entire personality should be characterized from the word. Your entire personality should be characterized from the Word. When they, people see you, they should see the Word. Yeah. When they see you, they should see the Word. Amen? So let's read on the verse, uh, verse James 1, 22 through 25. says, Be doers of the Word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the Word... And not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. Now, observing means to look carefully and cautiously. Observing is uh, actually opposed to taking a glance. You know, you can observe something. It means you spend time observing, you're watching, you're, you're looking very carefully and cautiously. Or you can take a glance at, you, at something. I guess one of the ways I want to describe this, women, you know what I'm talking about. You observe yourself in the mirror, or you can take a glance at yourself in the mirror. Women like put a lot of emphasis on their hair. We all know that, right? Women put a lot of emphasis on their hair. They like 
doing their hair. They're never satisfied with their hair, but they like doing their hair. But when you, but there are times when you observe yourself in the mirror. I'm going somewhere with this now. Or there's sometimes you glance at yourself. Now, I can always tell when I get in the car after my wife has driven it. Because 99% of the time, the mirror is going to be turned right to me. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? The mirror is going to be turned right to me. That means they're glancing at themselves before they leave, right? They want to make sure everything's in order. They want to make sure it, maybe they need to make some adjustments or some changes. Come on now. Amen? Now let's, let's read on here. They're like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forget what kind of man he was. Forgets what kind of man he was. That means if you look at yourself and you walk away, that means you don't make the right adjustments. You don't make the changes maybe that you want to make or you need to make. You follow me? It's the same way with born, being a born-again Christian. That's what it's saying here. Being a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word is like a person that looks in the mirror and glances and then walks away and forget what they saw. So forget what a man is unless a Christian acts quickly or promptly. After they hear the word, they will forget the changes and improvements that their reflection showed them that they need to make. You follow what I'm saying? There's a difference in hearing the word, and the word is, is, is telling you the difference in hearing the word and being a doer of the word. So let me say that again. When you forget what kind of man he is, Unless Christians act quickly or promptly after they hear the word, they will forget the changes and improvements that their reflection shows them that they need to make. Or the, what the reflection is, the reflection of the word, what the word shows them they need to make. Sometimes we, that, that means sometimes you can read the word about, let's just say, unforgiveness. The Bible says if you don't forgive others, he won't forgive you. But then you're still holding a grudge against somebody. That's what it's talking about. That's being a hearer of the word and not doer of the word. I'm trying to help you tonight now. Come on now. But the word of God now is not just for encouragement or building up your faith. The word, the scripture, the word of God is also for discipline and correction. We don't like that part of it. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. When you get there, say amen. Amen. It says all, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. says all scripture. How much scripture? All. That's everything in the word from Genesis to Revelation. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Reproof is to rebuke for, wrong, rebuke for wrong behavior or wrong belief. That's what the Word of God is for. It's to correct you in your wrong behavior or your wrong belief. The Scripture exposes sin that can then be dealt with through confession and repentance. I didn't go good. Let's go to correction. The scripture is also for correction. Correction, not only does scripture rebuke wrong behavior or rebukes the sin in our life, it also points the way back to a godly lifestyle. Amen. Amen. So it's for correction. It, it doesn't just condemn you as far as what you are doing wrong in the sin in your life, but it also points you the way back to a godly lifestyle. Now, instruction in righteousness is just positive training in godly behavior. That means the word, isn't going, the word is going to instruct you into righteousness. It will never instruct you out of righteousness. Right? All right, let's go to, um, let's go to James chapter 1, verse 25. We're going to come back to this in just a minute. James chapter 1 and verse 25 It says, but he 
who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, the perfect law of liberty is the perfect law of freedom. It's the word of God. That's what the word of God is, the perfect law of liberty. You follow me? But he who looks into the word of God and continues in it or be doers of it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. Amen? So the one who looks into the word of God, the works into the perfect law of freedom and continues in it and don't forget what he's heard, but be a doer of the word, this one will be blessed. Now hold your place and go to John chapter 8. We're talking about practice makes perfect. We should be practicing righteousness, not practicing unrighteousness. Right. Oh, you know what? I'm going to have to turn now. John chapter 8, what did I say, verse 31? 31 through 36, John chapter 8. Now, this is, this is, this is a, some instructions that Jesus was teaching the Jews and his disciples. And it says this. This is important here. It says in verse 31, Then Jesus said to those Jews, He said to the Jews who believed him, who believed him as Jesus, right? If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If you abide in my word, if you remain in, if you continue in my word, plus what we just talked about, continuing the perfect law of liberty into the law of freedom. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The word shall make you free. Not only do you know the word, but knowing the word is going to make you free. Now, this is interesting. Listen to what the uh, Jews said. They answered him. The Jews said, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. They were responding to what Jesus said, the truth shall make you free. But the Jews said, we are Abraham's descendants. We have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? See, they were, they, they, they were, they were asking him in a natural sense. They were thinking in the natural. But Jesus was teaching them in the spiritual realm. So look at what he said. In verse 34, Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. You follow me? He says, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Now, that's interesting right there in verse 34. It says, now, the MacArthur Study Bible says it this way. It said, the idea of commit sin, in parentheses, means to practice sin. That's what it's talking about here. He's talking about practice in sin and actually says practice sin habitually if you have a habit of sinning if you're struggling with the same sin every day day after day month after month that's what it's talking about practice in sin everybody say practice practice, practice in sin that's what it's talking about so you can say most surely I said whoever practices sin is a slave of sin and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. The ultimate bondage that Jesus is referring to is spiritual bondage to sin. You follow me? Which is really rebellion against God. Because when you sin, when you practice sin, you rebel against God. God died on the cross, redeemed us from our sins. He didn't, re he didn't die on the cross for you to live in it. He died on your cross to be forgiven from it. Right. Amen. Amen? Amen? You were saved by grace, but he, he died to redeem us from our sins. Amen? Amen? So while the Jews, listen to this, while the Jews thought of themselves as free sons of Abraham or descendants of Abraham, in reality, what Jesus was saying is they're slaves to sin. 
That means just because they were seeds of Abraham or just because they were descendants of Abraham doesn't mean that they were the righteousness of God. Then you, you, can be, you can be the seeds of Abraham and you can be the descendants of Abraham, but it's more important that you're a child of God. Because nothing trumps being a child of God. Now, we are seeds of Abraham, and we are descendants of Abraham. But if you're a not believer, you're not a Christian, you're not really considered seeds of Abraham. Because you haven't entered into the kingdom family of God. But what happens when we enter into the kingdom family of God? Then we're called the children of God. Amen? So what does it say about the children of God? It says, and a slave does not abide in the house forever. A in other words, he's talking about a slave to sin does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Amen. Now we know what abide means, to commit to, to remain in, to dwell in, to reside in. That's what abide means. Yes. Amen? Amen? So if you're, if you're living a sinful lifestyle then, I don't know how to say this gracefully, but you need to rededicate your life to Christ. Amen. I'll say it that way. Because we done told, we, by the scripture, we're saying that you cannot be a child of God and live continuously in sin. That's the good way to say it. Amen? Yes. So it says here in verse 36, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. How many recognize that? Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus died on the cross to set you free from your sins. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many free people we have in the house tonight? I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory. I'm free indeed. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The New Living Translation Going back to verse, let's go back to James 1.25. It says, but he who looks into the law of liberty, which is the, the, the perfect law of freedom, which is the word of God, which is we, we, went, we talked about freedom here, freedom from sin, and is not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. The New Living Translation said, but if you look carefully into, into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. He will bless you for doing the word. It doesn't say he'll bless you for hearing the word, even though we need to hear the word. We need to hear it over and over again. Why do we need to hear it? To do it. We need to hear it so we'll be a doer of the word. Amen? All right, let's change. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, Romans chapter 1, verses, let's go to verse 29 through 32. I've, I've said this passage of Scripture before, but I want to point something out in this. It says, verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are all whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. There's a lot going on here in the scripture. It talks about unrighteousness. All this falls under the category of unrighteousness. But this is the point I want to get to. Verse 32. Who, knowing the righteous judgment of God. Now, why does that put in there? You could, actually, you could actually even skip that verse and you would think it would be fine, right? You could read it as, uh, I'll start in verse 30. Backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors, evil things, 
disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, that those who practice those things are deserving of death. That's not what it says. It says, who knowing the righteous judgment of God. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, he's not talking about ignorant people here. He's not talking about ignorant people here. He's talking about blatant rebellious people here. You follow me? See, people, there are people that are ignorant of the word of God. We know that. But there are people that are just blatant rebellious to what God's word is. In other words, they know the word of God. They know about the word of God. And they actually have a spiritual conscience. They have the Holy Spirit inside of them. That's, now that's, I'm, I'm trying to break this down for you. He's talking about people that have an alarm system on the inside of them that when they know they shouldn't be doing something they shouldn't do, but they do it anyway. Right. He's talking about people that have a, a little bit of knowledge about Christ, what, about knowledge about right and wrong. You follow me? Who knowing the righteous judgment of God. That's... that's let me finish. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice, everybody say practice, practice, practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. I don't want to read that slightly. And approve, but also approve of those who practice them. That is a, that is a dangerous lane to be in. That, that is a dangerous lane to be in. That is also an easy lane to be in. This day and time, it's an easy lane to be in. You follow what I'm saying? Now, even, even with family members, the best way I can describe this is don't assist people into their spiritual destruction. Don't assist people into their spiritual destruction or don't assist them into their eternal death. And sometimes we have family members that maybe you believe in, maybe they believe in lesbian and gay lifestyle. They believe that a boy can be a girl and a girl can be a boy. Well, if you approve of that, what are you deserving of? Death. So, so we have to be careful. Um, we don't want to... Don't ever create a climate for sin to flourish. Don't ever create a climate for sin to flourish just because you don't want to rub somebody the wrong way. Let me give you another illustration. Dr. Kevorkian. I mean, I know Dr. Kevorkian. He assisted in suicides. In natural suicides. So this is what it's talking about here. It's talking about not natural suicide. It's talking about spiritual suicide. It's talking about it, it, it's talking about how we as Christians should should stand firm and know what the Word of God says about the hard things, the difficult things. Or or let me say this. Pornography, that touched on this last service or service or less. That can be considered this day and time normal. Be careful with normal. Because it can fall under the category of, uh, of approve of those who practice them. In other words, don't let your coworkers send you pictures you shouldn't get. Because then, then, then you fall into that lane that I just talked about. That, that spiritual suicide lane. That, that, that category of proven of... of you, you understand what I'm saying? You got to be careful, men. Don't fall into that lane where, where you are going to approve of someone sinning. Don't approve of sin, period. Whether it's someone else... I don't even approve of what they believe if, it's, if they're believing the wrong thing. You, you follow what I'm saying? I'm, tr I'm trying to teach you something tonight, and I, I, I'm trying to get it across as much as I can, that we got to be careful. These are, these are, these are, this is the Word of God. 
this is written in the Word of God, that we as Christians, we have to be strong. You know, we can, we can say we're strong Christians. We can say we're, we're the head, not the tail. We're above, not the beast. We're winners in Christ Jesus. But when someone sends you a picture on your cell phone that you shouldn't receive, and then you just look at it, then, 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 then you're being contrary to what the Word of God says. You, you fall into that lane, that dangerous lane, which is, I said it a while ago, it's an easy lane to get into, but it's dangerous. It's a dangerous lane to be in. Don't agree with someone that, that says, oh, abortion's okay. Don't agree with that. Abortion is murder and always be murder. We've had people leave the church because I've, we have said that behind the pulpit. But the Word of God is the Word of God. Amen. We, can't, we, can't, we can't sugarcoat to keep people in the church. Amen. Because I'd rather for you to, to stay and go to heaven than to stay and go to hell. Amen. You see what I'm saying? So you got, you got to be careful what especially this day and time, what the world is trying to contaminate you with. And especially with, you know, LBGTQ, it's, it's getting really popular. Uh, you, you see it on commercials. You see it on TV shows. I mean, it's getting, don't get hooked on watching that. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Don't get hooked on watching that. And, oh, it's okay if I watch that. It's okay. Be careful. Don't get into that lane. It's an easy lane to be in. But what I say about the word, it's not just for edifying and uplifting. It's also for discipline, reproof, and correction. So sometimes that's not an easy message to hear. But it's one that we need to hear. Because I'm, I'm going to teach you into heaven. I'm going to preach you to heaven. I'm not, I'm not going to compromise on what the word of God says. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, last scripture. Let me say this. First, uh, Romans 1, chapter 16 and verse 17. Let's end on a good note. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone, everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, for in the word of God, is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. faith. Everybody say, the just, the just shall, live shall live by faith. By faith. I, I will live by the Word of God. The word of God. Hallelujah.